Hey, Kevin Feige, it's me, Nando, the YouTuber who secretly writes all the Marvel movies and the shows like that last one. Um, what was it called? I feel like there was one that came between Guardians of the Galaxy and now maybe like June of 2023, maybe like six episodes long. I don't know. I don't remember any details about it. So let's say that one doesn't count, but all the rest of them. Anyway, I saw Taika was out there talking about his plans for Thor 5, said he wants a bigger villain than Hela. So I guess that means we're just talking about Thor 5 out loud now, which I'm a little confused because in your text last year, you said, Hey Nando, it's Kevin Feige from June of 2022. I'm on top of the world, baby. Multiverse of Madness is making boatloads of money. The people liked Moon Knight and our big new movie, Thor Love and Thunder, is about to be released in theaters. If Ragnarok is any indication, this is going to be an incredible summer that will put those MCU is in decline think pieces to bed once and for all. So let's get started on the next Thor project. Can you give me a pitch for a fifth Thor movie, Big Feige? But then, a couple weeks later, you just sent me a text that said, never mind. So, not sure what to think about this. But just in case you are still interested, I did work out some pitches for that fifth Thor movie. In fact, I have five. So I want to go through all of those with you in order of how much I'd like them. And listen, you cannot watch this video until after the strikes are over. Yes, Kevin Feige, I know you are cool. Obviously, you want to make sure the writers and actors get a fair deal. But like, a lot of your friends don't, so until they get with the picture, no pitches. But okay, I want to set the stage a little bit by talking about Thor himself and what this movie needs to do. Because Thor is tricky. Thor is the difficult middle child of the Avengers. Not quite as fun as Iron Man, and not quite as steady as Captain America. But Thor was always his own man with his own unique identity. First with Brana, he was serious, Shakespearean, tragic, and then came Taika. That's not fair actually, Joss had a lot to do with it. But Taika redefined Thor. He became sort of a guy. Sure, he had this silly English Viking accent thing going, but he spoke more like a normal person. He was awkward, kinda dumb, relatable. But I think this is a reasonable move for the character. He spent more time on Earth, around these nerds, and he got hit in the head, a lot. It is a wonder Thor can form a complete sentence. And while Taika's first outing, Thor Ragnarok, was a huge franchise invigorating hit, his second, Thor Love and Thunder, was not. Fans did not like it, critics did not like it, it made the most money of any Thor movie but not by very much, and it sort of killed any excitement for a Taika Thor trilogy. But that might be coming. Like I said, there have been rumors over the last few weeks that it is being discussed. And while you guys came out and said those rumors are false, they always are until they're not. And continuing this franchise that makes $800 million on a bad day makes sense financially. So I think you'll do it. And you know what? I think it's a good idea. Because I think Love and Thunder is not that bad. In fact, here's a segment I like to call, Listen, here are 10 reasons why Love and Thunder is not that bad. Number one, the opening scene is great. Gore meeting with and killing his tall god was the perfect intro to his character. Also love how it started without fanfare, just fade into Gore's family dying. Perfect. Honestly, I think this is the one bit that actually improves on the comic. Having Gore's faith be absolutely destroyed and showing us that some of these gods are just jerks makes his position a lot more relatable. Number 2. The Thor vs the Chicken Puppet fight is fantastic. Looks great, tons of fun to watch, just a wonderful introduction in one of these movies. And I think the Guardians are utilized well. They're this family that Thor always wishes he had. Number 3. The Thor and Jane romance is nice. I enjoyed watching them break up because they're the two busiest people on Earth, and all their interactions in this movie felt very natural. Also, the Mighty Thor costume looked terrific. And the first Thor costume, the Guardian's vest. And that second Thor costume, the leather. We should have stuck with that because all those looks were perfect. Number 4. This joke. We will return with children. Many children. And then we shall feast. Hold on, the children. Do not do that anymore. Those were dark times. Shameful times. Okay, we should go. Very funny. Hemsworth is funny. He is too handsome to also be funny. It's not fair. Number five. Loved seeing all these gods at the Omnipotent City. This could have been a small boardroom kind of meeting, but instead they went for it and it made the universe feel big. Number six. Russell Crowe was a thoroughly watchable Zeus. I loved his vibe. He was sort of an idiot, but he also had a plan, and he just loved orgies. Also, I could not get enough of this turn, and clever writing in that post credit scene lets him say heroes without saying it. Fun. 
Number 7. The Shadow Realm Fight. Rules. End of story. It's well shot, creative, makes great use of light and shadow, and the idea that Gore can just summon an army of random monsters is a great way to deal with the fact that Hela basically stole his main weapon in Thor Ragnarok. Number 8. Thor giving the kids powers is fun. It's cute. Little girl with the teddy bear. This line. God is therefore worthy and shall possess for limited time only the power of Number 9. The overall message of the movie being about choosing love over hate is a good message for a movie like this. And the cast really sells these big emotional moments. Hemsworth, Portman, Bale. Everybody is going for it. And number 10. Brett Goldstein, while not my original pick for Hercules, looks great in this scene. So there you go. But yeah, I understand what people did not love about this one. It's messy, shifts wildly in tone, but this team can work. Taika can direct a good Thor movie, Hemsworth can play a good silly Thor, Ragnarok proved this. So if Taika is bringing this team back, what should this new movie look like? Well, what are his strengths? Taika Waititi has a terrific record. If all I knew him from was being the guy who made what we do in the shadows, that would be enough. One of the funniest movies of the decade that launched one of the funniest shows ever made. But then you've got Jojo Rabbit, which is a masterclass in mixing dark comedy with genuine gut-wrenching drama. Having the Nazis salute each other endlessly, a goofy Hitler, Sam Rockwell's whole deal. While it might not be perfect, I cannot think of another movie that does what Jojo Rabbit is doing so well. And that's another written by and directed by Taika. So when people say, oh yeah, Taika can direct these, but he can't write them and manage this mix of drama and comedy because look at Love and Thunder, I say, look at Jojo Rabbit, and that proves under the right conditions he can. And I'm not here to make excuses for Thor Love and Thunder, but this movie was in a really tough spot being one of the first big post-pandemic movies. It's clear lots of it was reshot. I'm not surprised that this one was on the messy side. And also, there are other projects that Taika has produced or directed but not completely written. The What We Do in the Shadows show, Our Flag Means Death, Reservation Dogs, Wellington Paranormal, Flight of the Concords. Taika is excellent at using a surreal genre to create relatable humor. What if vampires went to a casino? What if Nazis had boring day jobs? What if your native spirit guardian was also just kind of a guy? But more than that, Taika is able to take bizarre caricatures and turn them into flawed people that feel somewhat real. Characters that are sometimes one-dimensional have relatable problems and conundrums that all of us deal with. Feeling like you're not good enough, navigating a complicated romance, finding closure after the death of a friend. And I do think Taika brought that to Ragnarok and Love and Thunder. Thor had a crisis of confidence. Hulk felt like he did not fit in. Jane grappled with her mortality, Valkyrie moved past a traumatic incident, Loki reconciled with his estranged family. These movies felt like genuine Taika Waititi projects. But the specific work that I really want to zero in on is another Taika project that I think should be the blueprint for a third Taika Thor project, Team Daryl. If you've never seen it, Team Daryl, which is the name given to three shorts called Team Thor 1, Team Thor 2, and Team Grandmaster, is a mockumentary set during the events of Civil War and before Ragnarok and then after Ragnarok, where Thor is forced to move in with a normal Australian man named Daryl, played by Daly Pearson, the creator of Talk To Me and producer of Bluey. I know, right? Daryl then moves in with the Grandmaster who attempts to take over the Earth via YouTube. Team Thor is everything that works about Ragnarok and Love and Thunder minus the big action scenes. But all the humor and even a fair amount of the character stuff is on display in these three shorts totaling about 14 minutes. And a big part of why it works comes from what I would say might be Taika's biggest strength, sharp timing. Like yes, he is not credited as the editor on these projects, but this kind of comedy and to some extent all comedy relies heavily on timing and there's a reason so many of these mockumentary sitcoms like The Office, Parks and Rec, Modern Family, and What We Do in the Shadows have become so successful. The jokes live in these unnatural crash zooms where the cameraman, another character in this scene, emphasizes some sort of shift in a character's demeanor. And these long pauses after a particularly awkward moment get to linger either punctuating a joke or creating a new tension that we the audience are forced to sit with. I know Hemsworth has stated that he thought Love and Thunder was too silly. I get it. But if I could get Taika to make my ideal MCU Thor project, and maybe that's what we're doing, it would be another comedy-drama hybrid in the vein of what we do in the shadows in Team Daryl. And if you wanted to, I think you could work that documentary framing device into the story, but it would exist more as a narrative assistant than a structure through which to view the reality of the story. So what would this movie actually be about? 
Well, let's look at our hanging threads from the last few Thor things. The big one is he's a dad now, so it's clear that some of the story would be about Thor balancing family and heroing. That's an interesting narrative tension that we have not done too much with in the MCU, even though all these characters are dads now. Outside of Ant-Man 3, we've never seen a father and son or daughter heroing together. And even in Ant-Man 3, we didn't really get into the difficulties of that relationship. Cassie showed up, learned to punch, and then was kidnapped. Now you could say the relationship between Rocket and Groot is father and son since that's what Groot says as he is dusted, but I think that's the only one, and even there it's mostly subtext. After all, we didn't know Groot called Rocket dad until after Infinity War. And Rocket and Groot have not spent too much time together since Infinity War. So we need to do the father-kid thing. We also need to deliver on the Hercules post credit scene. Apparently, Zeus survived being totally killed and then charged his Brett Goldstein son Hercules with exacting his revenge and showing the people why they should fear the gods. So that needs to happen. And I think it's worth doing. Hercules can play an interesting role in this story. He can parallel Thor in some new ways. Herc can feel like Thor did in Thor 1, and that can contrast Thor's growth. And because of his relationship with Zeus, Hercules can expand on the father-kid theme that love is also bringing to the table. Also, Hercules is just a super fun character, one that can show up in a lot of these things in the future. All right, Kevin, so like I said, Five pitches, in order, starting with the one I don't love, but think could happen, and ending with the one I like the most, and also think should happen. Let's begin. This one is based off the Siege comic event, the story where Norman Osborn and the Dark Avengers attacked Asgard, which at the time existed in Oklahoma. So here's how I see this one playing out. As we know, in the MCU, after the events of Secret Invasion, new Asgardians are designated enemy combatants by President Ritson. So King Valkyrie calls Thor for help, expecting the Avenger to be able to broker some sort of amnesty for the displaced Asgardians. Thor comes back, President Ross, who succeeded Ritson, agrees to negotiate with King Valkyrie and Thor, but during the negotiation, Hercules attacks. So we get our first big fight between Thor and Hercules, and we see that they're pretty well matched. And this is a fight like the Thor Carol fight from What If, where they're knocking each other into different continents. Thor is able to put Hercules down, but because of the destruction, Ross declares war against New Asgard. Thor rallies with the New Asgardians and creates what we will call his War Council, consisting of Valkyrie, Korg, Meek, and Sif. He tries to get help from Banner, but Bruce can't get involved because he's worried about what Ross will do to his son if he raises his profile. None of the other Avengers that are alive really have a strong connection to Thor, so he's not able to get help from them. Doctor Strange is busy in the Dark Dimension or something. The Guardians are in the middle of their own conflict. So besides his friends and the other Asgardians, Thor is on his own. And this is where Thor and a now captive Hercules talk. They're not so different. Hercules realizes now that Zeus was the one at fault and he owes Thor, so Hercules can be a new ally in this movie. And in this movie, we play him kind of like Drax. He's a big old dude who loves to get into his scrap, but does it with a smile on his face. Hercules doesn't take things nearly as seriously as Thor does after all of his character development, so that can be a source of tension for the two. But Thor is low on allies, so he is willing to work with the mighty Hercules. Thor hears from someone, who we can assume is Hawkeye, that Ross is planning to attack New Asgard by the end of the week. The War Council prepares for the Siege of New Asgard, they come up with some strategies for dealing with Red Hulk, and they wait. And then we get this movie's equivalent of the Civil War airport fight. Ross attacks. First, he throws some army guys at New Asgard that Thor and his friends are able to deal with pretty easily, but those guys only exist to show Ross what Thor is working with so that Ross can prepare his real team, the Thunderbolts. So this movie would really be Thor versus the Thunderbolts. And listen, I don't know where that team will end up after their Thunderbolts movie, but I'm going to bet that some of them turn good, but the rest of the team continues to exist the same way that the Suicide Squad never fully goes away. It just rotates in new members to replace the ones that turn good or die. But these Thunderbolts are basically a stand-in for the actual Siege comic villains, the Dark Avengers. General Ross is your Norman Osborn, and he's leading a team of US Agent, Taskmaster, who's probably in the movie going to be revealed to be Zemo or something, but whatever, this is the real Taskmaster, Tony Masters, Ghost, and the character rumors point to the Thunderbolts fighting in their movie, The Sentry. And we will learn that after Hercules defected, Zeus sent another soldier to help take down Thor, Ares, who has allied with the Thunderbolts. And this is your big exciting action moment. This is probably where you would go kill Korg or something like that. And the fight ends when Sentry goes void, steals love, kills Ares, and disappears. Then Thor, Hercules, and the rest of his war council need to rescue love and stop Sentry before he kills everyone. So it's pretty simple. Obviously, positives. We can pay off the secret invasion finale. 
and Hercules and Thor get to spend a lot of time together, which also creates a pretty convenient intro to Ares. The MCU loves to do this kind of stuff, the same way it originally seemed like they were going to do Super Scroll, not with the Fantastic Four powers, but with leftover MCU powers. This way they could do Dark Avengers, but since they don't have Venom or Wolverine or an MCU Norman Osborn, they can use these guys, Dark Avengers at home. And I sort of like this version of the team more, because there are clear analogs. US Agent is the Captain America, Ares is the Thor, Sentry is the Iron Man, Red Hulk is the Hulk, Ghost is the Widow, and Taskmaster is the Hawkeye. So the team is a near perfect mirror of the original MCU Avengers. But we have negatives. This does not feel like a particularly strong escalation from Hela. Yes, the Void is a big deal, but not a huge step up. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Thunderbolts kill Sentry at the end of their movie, and without him, these Thunderbolts are not that big of a deal. Also, Secret Invasion is definitely not going to play a big role in the future of the MCU since nobody liked it. But this siege story could be fun. It's a good place to start. Number two. Okay, so if I was a betting man, and I am, I snap on turn one sometimes. So because I am a betting man, I would bet this is what we get. Do I think it's the strongest choice? Maybe, maybe not, but it depends. Story here is very simple. For one reason or another, maybe the destruction of Asgard, another secret prisoner slash relative wakes up. This one is Odin's secret brother, Kull Borson, who is also known as the Serpent. He is the Asgardian god of fear. This could also be Hercules' doing, like he freed Kull himself, because if you remember, Zeus' exact command was, They will fear us again. This would make sense. Unleash the god of fear. It kills the superheroes, the gods stop it, everybody loves the gods again. So Hercules frees Cole, and Cole does what he does in the Fear Itself storyline from 2011. He throws some evil hammers to Earth, which turn a few superheroes and villains into his worthy. And this can be anyone we want, really anyone we can get. She-Hulk, Shang-Chi, M'Baku, Moon Knight, Red Hulk, Doctor Strange, doesn't matter. Whoever is available. And they all just raise hell, destroying everything. Thor is called back to help defend Earth, and Hercules learns the error of his ways and helps Thor. So this movie is a team-up where Thor and Hercules take down the Worthy to defeat Cole before he spreads enough fear to become unstoppable. I could also see Cole's long-term plan being to kill Thor and Rey's love as his own so that he can turn her into his fear-spreading successor. And by the end of the film, you could have all the hammers destroyed except for one, which Beta Ray Bill can find in a post credit scene. Some positives, it ties back directly to that fear line from Love and Thunder. Having Cole be on one side of the emotional spectrum and Love being on the other also gives her a place in this story. Involving the other heroes and villains from other Marvel properties could be fun. But my big negative is Cole is a lot like Hela, secret Asgardian god and Thor relative who was locked away and is now free. You could change Cole to Phobos and have him be the Greek god of fear so he's sort of new, but I don't see how the fear spreader is that much more severe of a threat than the goddess of death or the god butcher. Number three. So this is the most recent Thor comic event I believe they could pull from. It is called The War of the Realms. In the comics, the story is that Malekith recruits an army of Thor villains to take over Midgard and all of reality. So a couple problems here right off the bat. Malekith is dead, although that's never stopped comics before. Also, Christopher Eccleston did not love Thor 2, but I think, like Portman, if the part is reimagined and the dump truck of money is big enough, he could be convinced. After all, Malekith is traditionally a much campier villain than he was in Thor 2. But the bigger issue, none of the villains from War of the Realms exist in the MCU. Hela is dead, Laufey is dead, we do not have an Ulic or Enchantress or Dario Agar or Cinder or Queen of Angels or any of the other supporting players in that story. So I don't think it's that much fun if we're just introducing a bunch of villains that don't have a grudge against Thor. Now this isn't to say that I don't think you could make any team of villains work, it's just that War of the Realms specifically is fun because this is Malekith getting together the Thor Legion of Doom. All of Thor's villains that have ever fought him alone work together as a team to take down the Avengers. And I think for this specific story to work, we would need to know who those guys are. Also, that story is more of an Avengers story than just a Thor story. So if we can't bring in a bunch of other stars, I'm not convinced it would work. But I do like that comic, so I wanted to include the pitch here. Number four. So this one seems very plausible, and I think the title says it all. It would be Thor, the Ballad of Beta Ray Bill. And I would say the main driver for this idea is that comic fans really like Bill. He is an alien from the planet Corvin who is engineered to be the perfect soldier after the destruction of his homeworld by the demon Surtur. Bill runs into Thor and, based on a misunderstanding, believes Thor is an agent of Surtur and the two fight. Bill wins and is able to lift Thor's hammer, making him the first non-Asgardian in the comics worthy to wield Mjolnir. 
Then the two fight a bit more, they become friends, and Odin gives Bill his own hammer named Stormbreaker. So adapt that story with some changes. First of all, Surtur seems to be dead. He was destroyed along with Asgard at the end of Ragnarok. I think. That's what the wiki says. Luckily, we have another big old villain waiting in the wings who loves to destroy planets, and lucky us, he's set to be introduced in Phase 5. So I would tweak Bill's backstory a little bit so that Corbin was actually destroyed by Galactus. The Corbinites flee, turn Bill into their champion to protect them from future planet eaters, and they bump into Thor. We could say that the fight doesn't start because Bill is interested in Thor. Instead, we can learn that, and follow me here, because Love got her superpowers from Eternity, and Eternity, like Galactus, is one of the cosmic entities, Love's power also comes from Power Cosmic. And because they're worried about running into Galactus again, Bill and the surviving Corbinites are ready to throw down against anyone with the Power Cosmic, even a child. So Thor needs to fight to protect Love. And in the comics, the Corbinites eventually settled on a planet they called New Corbin, which Galactus did try to destroy, which kicked off a rivalry between Bill and Galactus. In fact, I would say Galactus is Bill's most consistent enemy, with Bill trying to get revenge against Galactus directly and frequently clashing with his heralds along the way. It also doesn't hurt that Mjolnir, Thor's hammer that only the worthy are able to wield, just came back into the picture in Thor Love and Thunder. If I were writing a Beta Ray Bill story, one of the first things I would do is figure out a way to revive Mjolnir, and now I don't need to. Also, Bill is close with another Thor supporting character that fans were hoping would eventually get a bigger role in these movies, Lady Sif. In the comics, Sif frequently goes on adventures with Bill. The two are even in a relationship together. So this would be a natural way to work Sif into one of these movies in a larger role. And hey, if Bill spins off into his own series or something, Sif could join him there as his sidekick, like Bucky or Lila. My negative here is I cannot think of a way to connect Hercules to this story. And maybe he doesn't actually need to be a part of it. That tease could just be about him coming to Earth to look for Thor, but instead of getting wrapped up in a story with Thor, he meets up with She-Hulk, or Wonder Man, or one of the other comic characters that Hercules has a history with. Goldstein is mostly a writer and actor known for a comedy series, so he would feel very at home in one of the MCU comedy series. And Galactus is a threat that could rival Hela, and this could be a way to reinforce how serious he is, like Thanos' role in Avengers or Guardians 1. He's not appearing in the movie, but we are seeing his destruction. This sense of dread is building slowly. This could be fun. But then the big question is who is the villain in this story? Because I don't think Galactus works yet. And rumors point to Terax being the villain in Fantastic Four, a movie that at this point feels like it will never be made. But who is the big bad that Thor and Bill can join forces to fight? Well, you could throw in Stardust, another herald of Galactus that Bill has fought in the past. Who knows? Maybe Galactus has multiple heralds, currently seeking out worlds for the world eater to eat. Maybe Stardust was the one who found new or original Corbin, and he is now hunting the Corbinites. After all, in the comics, that's his deal, and why Stardust has crossed paths with Bill. The rest of the Heralds just move on once a planet is destroyed, but Stardust makes sure there are no survivors. And if Stardust got wind of Love's powers, he'd absolutely want to hunt her down and bring her to Galactus. Maybe Stardust at this point is no longer a Herald, or he's been demoted to Regional Herald or something like that, but bringing in a hero made from the Power Cosmic will get him back into Galactus' good graces. And if Thor and Bill spend the entire movie fighting and barely killing Stardust, that will make Galactus look like that much more of a threat. Honestly, I like this one a lot. It feels smaller, more intimate, but there are still implied stakes and everyone likes Bill. If you don't believe me, read the Daniel Warner Johnson run from a couple years back. Gorgeous art and a solid introduction of the character. And that is my Nando comic recommendation of the video. See, I forgot, but I'm doing it again for now. Okay. So like I said, I like a lot of these, but if I needed to pick one that checks all the boxes and would be just an overall good time, I think a movie based on the Chaos War comic from 2010 does the trick. So here's the pitch for this one. Thor is busy protecting the universe and being a single dad, trying to balance work and family, but it's super messy and it's driving him nuts. He's defeated Hela and Thanos and the God Butcher. Why can't Thor handle the chaos of being a single parent? What is wrong with him? And part of the trouble is Thor's having a tough time showing Love that she is actually part of his family. He can tell she does not fully feel like she belongs yet. And this parallels Odin's relationship with his son Loki, which, you know, didn't work out so well. So Thor worries he's becoming his father. I think it could be a good framing device if Love is filming their adventures on her phone. Seeing all this stuff from a child's perspective can be fun, like the beginning of Spider-Man Homecoming. And this sort of home movie aesthetic will help nail down the genre here. 
This movie is Clash of the Titans by way of National Lampoon's Vacation. And again, this is the kind of comedy that we know Taika does really, really well, so let's lean into it. Anyway, after this intro, we check on Hercules, who is traveling the galaxy looking for Thor. He sees all the people Thor and Love helped along the way, gets a little conflicted, but Hercules values family, especially as Zeus is estranged son, Hercules wants to prove his worth to the gods. So he stays the course, and eventually he finds Thor and Love. They fight, nearly a stalemate until Love steps in and blasts Hercules, knocking him out. Thor sends Hercules back to Zeus via the Bifrost. Hercules has failed, sort of like Adam Warlock in Guardians 3, and because of his failure he is banished from the omnipotent city. Zeus is angry so he decides to send another god, one that will certainly kill Thor and send a message, Ares. Ares is basically what if the Punisher was a god, and he assembles a team of evil gods consisting of himself, the Egyptian Seth. Cinder, daughter of Surtur, and for insurance, an old Shinto god that Zeus had imprisoned in the omnipotent city for centuries, Amatsu Mikaboshi. Ares gets a lot of pushback from the Shinto god Amaterasu, but he overrules her and frees Mikaboshi. And to watch over all of this, Zeus sends a warrior angel that has risen through the ranks and gotten a reputation for being one of the best assassins in the galaxy, Angela. In this universe, the angels are the agents of Christian God, who does exist in the Marvel pantheon, but we didn't see him before because during Love and Thunder, Thor visited Omnipotent City on a Sunday and God was busy. But in this movie, he is part of the God Council. Give him a cameo, he can be played by Matt Berry. That is non-negotiable. And this new team of evil gods, led by Ares, seeks out Thor and finds him in New Asgard. So we can still do the siege led by Ares and have Thor, Sif, Axel, Korg, and Valkyrie fight against the invading gods. Angela hangs back because she's skeptical of Zeus's motives, but that still leaves Ares, Seth, Cinder with Mikaboshi in his last resort, which together are way more than the Asgardians can handle. We learn Hercules followed Ares and he intervenes in the fight between Ares and Thor because Hercules doesn't want Ares to steal his glory. Ares gets mad and fights Hercules, which gives Thor space to help defeat Cinder and Seth, leaving only Ares and Mikaboshi. Because he's backed into a corner, Ares releases Mikaboshi, which immediately flees. So the fight ends. Ares, Seth, and Cinder retreat. Thor and Hercules bond a little bit. Angela stays on Earth to observe Thor. There's something familiar about him, but you can't figure out what. But then we get a warning in the form of Christian God and Bast, who appears in her human form like in Love and Thunder. They explain that Mikaboshi traveled to the omnipotent city and massacred most of the gods. We can see this play out through Ares' team's eyes, as they are also defeated by Mikaboshi. Zeus and most of the gods there are now enslaved by Mikaboshi, who is now calling himself the Chaos King. Thor says they must stop him, but Bast says it's not that simple. You see, Mikaboshi, like all gods, can travel to different pantheons, and he is using his god army to enslave the rest of these gods. Eventually, his army will be unstoppable. So Thor readies his allies, including the Avengers. But another problem, if Mikaboshi is traveling to the different pantheons, only gods can follow him. That means no Avengers can go. Regular Asgardians who aren't technically gods like Valkyrie or Sif can't even help Thor. So he needs to create a group from the comics known as the God Squad. And if you did not want to call this movie Thor the Chaos War, I think you could get away with Thor God Squad. The God Squad consists of Thor, Hercules, Bast, Angela, who Thor knows is a god but cannot tell how, and a couple of others. We have options. For instance, Christian God can be involved here too, although I do think it's probably better to leave him on Earth, make that a cameo, you don't want to overstay your welcome. We could bring in someone like Snowbird, who is a god in Marvel Comics. And I mean, even more important than being a god, she's also a member of Alpha Flight, everyone's third favorite X-Men team. I'd also love to involve some Eternals. I think Eternals is maybe the most slept on Phase 4 thing. Like, it's good. And these characters are fun, so I'd like to bring back one of them, like Cersei or Kingo or Thena, to join Thor's God Squad. We don't know all that much about how they work, so let's say that they were also worshipped as gods, and being part celestial makes them enough god to qualify. Cersei was originally on the comic God Squad, after all. And if you're wondering, hey, didn't they all get captured at the end of Eternals? Listen, I don't know if we're getting another Eternals movie, so I feel like it's this or nothing. Let's just say the Celestial let him go. Where Cersei escaped, or when Mikaboshi attacked the Omnipotent City, the Celestial that was holding them prisoner was defeated. 
So Thor leaves love with Korg, Valkyrie, and Sif and travels with the God Squad to the Omnipotent City. But after they've left and there is no turning back, we learn that Love actually took advantage of the fact that she has three different babysitters and snuck into the Godmobile like Spritel and Chim Chim, so she's going on this adventure too. And she brought her phone, so between battles we can get more handheld camera segments, including some confessionals. The God Squad travels to the Omnipotent City and follows Mikaboshi to Olympus and then Valhalla. We can bump into some dead Asgardian characters like Heimdall or even Jane who are defending their realm from Mikaboshi. And Mikaboshi keeps winning and keeps amassing a larger and larger army. And as the God Squad is following Mikaboshi, you can see some relationships begin to form between the team and Love. Hercules begins to act like the fun uncle or Funkle, playing games with Love. Bost, Cersei, and Angela are all ants, taking care of Love and teaching her lessons, helping her braid her hair and teaching her how to fight with two short swords. Bost can even transform into her panther form and give Love some panther rides. And this takes a lot of the pressure off Thor, which gives him space to figure out a plan. You see, Mikaboshi seems to be searching for more power, enslaving Zeus, and then Odin, and then Surtur, and Ra, he's attempting to gain enough energy to kill the other cosmic entities. We learn that Mikaboshi was created when Eternity was born. He's He's basically a cosmic twin who wants to destroy everything. Mikaboshi is described in the comics as the void against which eternity is defined. So the only thing standing between Mikaboshi and total domination are the other cosmic entities like Infinity, Death, Galactus, the Living Tribunal, and some others. Thor realizes that even though Mikaboshi enslaved Odin, he was not able to absorb Odin's power since Odin no longer has it. That must be the final piece Mikaboshi is looking for, which means maybe Thor can use the Odin Force, which exponentially magnifies an Asgardian's strength to destroy Mikaboshi. So the God Squad travels to the ruins of Asgard and Thor attempts to wield the Odin Force that's just kind of been sitting there dormant. But second act twist, it was all a trap and when Thor takes some of the Odin Force, Mikaboshi shows up and captures Thor. The God Squad tries to stop Mikaboshi but he's too powerful so they fail and are left stranded in space. Thor becomes the servant of Mikaboshi. We can give him his cool Herald of Galactus costume and Mikaboshi takes his God Army and leads an assault on the Living Tribunal. Mikaboshi figures once he's destroyed the Living Tribunal, that will mean he has destroyed order in the universe, and what's left to take over after order? Chaos. He will become unstoppable. The God Squad hits rock bottom having lost their only shot at stopping Mikaboshi, but let's say Hercules, inspired by Thor's leadership, suggests he could try to wield the Odin Force. Bost knows this won't work since he is not a descendant of Odin. Attempting it will almost certainly kill Hercules, but Hercules doesn't care. This is their last shot, so he wades out into space and opens himself up to the Odin Force, which immediately starts killing him. But before he dies, Angela goes in to save Hercules. Big explosion, they both die. But actually, Angela reappears, powered by the Odin Force, holding a barely still alive Hercules. Everyone's shocked, and the Odin Force opens Angela's memory to the truth that the gods hid from her. She is actually Odin's second-born daughter, who Odin was forced by the other gods to give up as punishment for his conquering everything with Hela. It's why he's so protective of Thor and Loki, and why Odin and the Asgardians never participated in any of the Omnipotent City nonsense. Odin was always trying to get her back, but Zeus's powerful magic stopped him. But Angela is, in fact, Odin's oldest living descendant and still holds the title she was born with, the Asgardian God of War. Because there's no tear in the MCU, so it's gonna be her. So the God Squad, led by a now empowered Angela, goes to make one last stand against Mikaboshi. Mikaboshi sends a mind-controlled Thor to fight Angela while Mikaboshi fights the Living Tribunal himself, and the rest of the God Squad takes on Mikaboshi's army. Angela is able to knock out Thor, free him from Mikaboshi's control, but then how do they kill Mikaboshi? This one's tricky since the way he is stopped in the comics is Amadeus Cho, who is around for this, and Galactus are attempting to create a reality that they can use to save the people of Earth, except they don't have enough time to evacuate everyone. But then they have the last minute idea of sending Mikaboshi into this new dimension instead and turning it from a refuge for humanity into Mikaboshi's prison. We could do that, problem is, that's sort of how What If ends, so I don't think we can swing that here. But also we've got another option. Thor and Angela attempt to team up and defeat Mikaboshi, but that doesn't work. They're not powerful enough. And then Angela realizes this exponential power thing makes more sense if one person has all the power, so she gives Thor her half of the Odin Force. And Thor, empowered by the love of his family and the Odin Force, still can't do it. He is not powerful enough. They're out of ways to use the Odin Force to stop Mikaboshi. Except, 
that theme of found family comes back and Thor realizes that maybe he's not strong enough but maybe he's not the strongest living descendant of Odin. After all, love has some sort of version of eternity's power. That's cosmic entity power, stronger than any of these guys. The other gods are worried. This might kill her like it almost killed Hercules. After all, love is not Asgardian. Then we can get some actual payoff to the Asgard is not a place, it's a people line. Thor uses that to explain that love should be able to wield the power. Mikaboshi knocks out the living tribunal and just when he's about to absorb his power, Thor jumps between the two of them with love and starts transferring her what we're now calling the Thor Force. Mikaboshi says it's futile since only Asgardians can wield it. And besides, love's not really Thor's daughter. Then, either Thor can do a version of the Asgard isn't a place, it's a people line, but now about family? Maybe family isn't born, it's chosen? Or we can do a callback line, and when Mikaboshi says she's not Thor's real family, he can say, sure she is. She's adopted. Then he gives love the Thor force, Kamehameha, Mikaboshi is imprisoned. And hell, if you really want to mess with the audience, we just freed Mikaboshi's god army, so let's take a second with Odin, Frigga, and Loki, who would presumably be part of it, and have them meet their grandchild. This movie will be about Thor dealing with chaos, and that comes in the form of his past in Hercules, his present fighting the literal god of chaos in Mikaboshi, and his future in raising love and his chaotic new family, the God Squad. So I hope you enjoyed the pitch, but before you go, I want to talk to you about one last thing. This video's sponsor, Henson Shaving. These guys are fantastic. We've had them on as sponsors to videos before, which means I've had this razor for a while. The first time I did a video for it was when She-Hulk was wrapping up. So I've had this razor for almost a year. This model is the AL-13, which I just learned recently is named that because it is made out of aluminum which is the 13th metal on the periodic table. So you want to remember that fact forever and just hold on to it for Jeopardy or something, AL-13. Anyway, this company, Henson, they used to manufacture parts for the space station, but then after COVID shut everything down, they used their fantastic engineering and put it into designing an excellent razor. So first of all, I've been using this razor forever. Now you may be wondering, razor, you have facial hair. Well, A, you gotta maintain it, you gotta have a clean line, and that's something you do with a razor. And B, I shave sometimes. I'm planning on going to New York Comic Con this year, probably dressed as Justin Hammer, and at least in Iron Man 2, he does not have facial hair, so I'm probably gonna shave for that. Anyway, this razor is fantastic for so many reasons. Like I said, it is precise. They're using aerospace engineering knowledge to craft this thing, so you hold it at a 30 degree angle, the blade just sticks out over the edge, and you get a nice, clean shave. Also, it's sustainable. Like I said, this thing is made of aluminum. It is three parts. You have the top part, bottom part, and the handle. Sure, there's a technical name for what those are, but I'm gonna go with top part, bottom part, handle. It's very easy to replace the razors, so you're gonna be able to do that as frequently as you need to, but because the razors are just a single razor and not a big piece of plastic with razors inside of it, you're not creating all that waste. Apparently, over two billion disposable razors enter landfills every year in the United States. So, like, that's not gonna happen with this. This thing's gonna last you for a very long time. Obviously, I haven't even had mine for more than a year, so it's still working well. But I expect this to be working for decades because it's precisely crafted, it's simple, and it's durable. Now you may be thinking, it's great that it is precise and well made, and it's very nice that it is not contributing to the destruction of our planet, but is it expensive? According to Henson, and this makes sense, like it's pretty logical, over two years they estimate this is going to cost you about $88, whereas over the course of two years a cartridge razor is going to cost you $265, which makes total sense because you're not changing out a million little cartridges, it's just one blade every time. Like I don't want to make this too complicated because I've been throwing a lot of numbers things like that at you. This. This razor, it's easy to use, it looks cool, it is well made, it's environmentally friendly, and over the course of like a year, two years, it's less expensive than the razor you're probably using now. So, go to hensonshaving.com slash Nando and enter Nando at checkout to get 100 free blades with your purchase. And remember, you need both products, the razor and the blades, in the cart for the code to take effect. So, I don't know what else to say. Henson Shaving, go check it out. I think you're going to love it. That's all I got. Thank you to everybody who continues to support the channel on Patreon. Everybody that watches these videos early and ad-free on Nebula. Everybody that listens to my podcast, Mostly Nitpicking. Everybody that follows me on Twitter, TikTok, Instagram, whatever social platform we're all on this week. I'm probably there at Nandovi Movies. That's all I got. Stay safe and I'll see you next time.